Welcome to Legends of Music. I'm your host, Norm Zeta. I have a wonderful guest with me today. His name is John Risen. John has performed in many different musicals and operas, including as the lead in West Side Story, uh, Beauty and the Beast, La Boheme, and Pirates of Penzance. He was part of a team that finished fourth in this year's America's Got Talent, and he throws a 92 mile per hour fastball. John, what a thrill having you on. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. By the way, before I forget, John has a website, johnrisen.com, and that's R I E S E N. Okay. John, tell me a little bit about your childhood and how you got into the music business. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm very blessed that I have a very uh, solid family uh, upbringing. My my parents are wonderful people who sang all through my childhood, and I have two siblings, an older sister and a younger brother, uh, both who have what's called perfect pitch. And what this means is that they can hear music in a way that other people can't, and so they could go and tell you that that note is a C sharp. I don't know what note it actually is because I do not have this gift. Right. And so I was the odd man out. I was the athlete in the family. And so growing up, I loved music. I loved hearing my parents sing and my dad would play piano. My mother would play cello. My sister would play clarinet. And um, I always wanted to do music, but I was, alas, a baseball player. And that was <laughs> my passion. Right. I, uh, my dad at a young age saw my athleticism and he as an athlete himself kind of nurtured that. He kind of pushed me and got me onto travel teams and into pony leagues and tournament teams and things like that. And I started to develop the athletic side of my life. Uh, and it wasn't until the end of my um, high school time that we really discovered that I could sing and that <laughs> whole life started. But my childhood was, I hate to say it, it's kind of cliche, but I kind of had a blissful childhood playing a lot of sports in a very loving environment. And I feel very blessed to have had that because it's allowed me to discover who I am. Um, and I've had hardships, everyone has hardships, but thankfully they haven't been related to my family and and things of that nature. Well, let me interrupt you and ask you a question. Would you prefer now to be a star baseball player or a star opera musical singer? That's a hard question. Um, I don't regret the change in my career path. I, I fell in love with music and performing music and singing because of what I can communicate to people, how it makes me feel, how it makes people feel. Um, it, it, there's something so intimate and personal about sharing your heart through music and singing. But there is this part of me that still misses, you know, being on the mound and throwing and um, the idea of a team. You know, you have all these guys on, on the field at the same time. And if one of you is weaker than the other, the whole team fails, this whole team thing of, you know, high tides raise all ships. I, I, I do miss that um, kind of mentality. But, oh, and of course, professional baseball players make huge amounts of money <laughs> uh, on average. And the professional musicians make fine money, but baseball is a definitely higher threshold. <laughs> but isn't it terrible to, like, lose a game for your team? I mean, you, you were the pitcher, right? Yes, I was. Okay, so. <laughs> it, it can hurt. It can hurt yeah. a little bit. I think that's yeah. part of the um, mental strength you grow through being an athlete. And I've actually been very grateful that I've had that and carrying that into a musical career because, you know, they say at the beginning of a career when you're auditioning in New York City and Los Angeles for managers and companies and, and trying to get work, you're lucky if you succeed once out of 10 times, which, you know, a 100 batting average, as they would say, that, that's, that's a lucky performer. And so most performers get told no 100 times to one. Um, and so you have to become strong and, and get used to this like mental discipline of like, no, it's not a comment on me. They wanted a banana and I'm an apple. And that kind of having that right, kind right. of mental strength to make it through the beginning part of being a professional singer. Um, thankfully, I'm past that part in my life, but I feel very thankful to have had my sports background because you're right, losing a game, it hurts, especially when it's your fault. You know, man on third, <laughs> two strikes, you know, uh, you know, full count. And you throw the ball in the dirt. And so the guy in third scores and you walk him. You lose the game. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Your fault. 
you have to move on. There's always another game. Um, and so that that's always informed my my performance career and my singing. So, okay, so you went to college. Yes. Where was that? I went to Michigan State University uh, in Lansing, Michigan. Originally, I was hoping to play baseball and um, to possibly do an engineering degree or something of that nature. And very quickly, I realized I could sing. I auditioned for the voice department and got a um, very large scholarship to be what's called a voice performance major and um, started my career as a singer. And so what happened at, What happened next? So it's kind of crazy. Um, so I, I go into this not knowing too much about it, right? I'd taken some voice lessons. I got kind of pushed into it because my, my grandmother um, at the time felt that all her grandchildren should be more well-rounded in the arts. And so my family thought, hey, John should learn how to sing because he can't sing in tune. He's the only one of us <laughs> who can't have a pitch. And this is true. This is true. My parents don't recant this. Uh, I mean, they'll, they'll, you know, agree with me. And um, so I took voice lessons and very quickly, the voice teacher I had in, you know, Livonia, Michigan, of all places, discovered that um, I had a really big instrument in there and that I had a really rare voice type, you know, especially I have a couple things about me that are rare, especially with stage performance. I'm six foot tall and athletic. Um, I'm what's called a tenor, but in musical theater land, I'm a baritoner. I can sing low and high and um, my voice is very loud, unamplified. So I can sing opera and musical theater because I can, you don't need a microphone to be heard on stage, which is pretty special. And so I kind of got pushed into this program, doors started opening and my voice teacher who was, uh, his name is Richard Fracker. He is still the head of voice at Michigan State. He sang at the Metropolitan Opera, I believe, for 12 or 13 seasons and was an understudy to people like Luciano Pavarotti, you know, the great Pavarotti. And he sang with Domingo and he sang with Rene Fleming and he sang with these, you know, unbelievable superstars of the opera world of the past. And um, he retired and came back to Michigan to to run Michigan State University's department. And he was my teacher. Side note, he grew up a baseball player. <laughs> that's that's incredible. So get this. Here I am taking voice lessons from this man. And it's, it's you know, and he, I'm a freshman in college. You don't think much of these things at the time. You're like, oh, this is so exciting. College, yay. Um, I go to a recital of his. He's performing on TV. And he walks out with a baseball cap on and a bat over his shoulder. And he sings this song that I now sing all the time called What You'd Call a Dream. And it's this song about reliving a memory of playing baseball. And I start weeping in the audience. And mind you, I had never cried publicly for something like this. You know, I, maybe I cried at a funeral or something, but to cry in public to music was not something I had done at this point in my life. And I couldn't believe how it made me feel. It like It's like he was talking to me with this song. And it, it really opened my mind to what would be next. And from there, I was kind of sold on what a performer could be. It's like, wow, okay, I can touch people with my story. I can share my past and my, who I am with people in this way. And very quickly, I got all the leads in the operas and the musicals, and this kind of went. And uh, I eventually got paid and a full ride to get a master's degree. And so I decided to continue doing this. And in that time, the Detroit Opera, which is a pretty major international opera house uh, in downtown Detroit, was looking for a young tenor to play a leading character in an opera. And they gave it to me as a 22 year old. Wow. And that was a big leap. And, and his name was Dr. D. Chiara. He's since passed, but he kind of built that entire um, uh, opera house from the ground up. And it's become one of the biggest in the world now. Um, and he gave me this rare opportunity to be a college student singing with A-list professionals. And that just, the, the doors, you know, flew open. When I graduated, I immediately had work uh, and I went down to the South and worked in Louisiana and Florida and Texas and Arkansas and Mississippi and kind of went around to different opera companies around there uh, and got some, um, what do you call it, some momentum. And as I got that momentum, uh, management took notice of me in New York City and I got signed and that kind of shot me out into the world. And to make a long story as short as possible, I had a rare opportunity to go to the Lincoln Center and have a private audition with the New York City Ballet and the Bernstein Foundation, the Leonard Bernstein Foundation. 
and they were looking for a guy to be the voice of Tony in West Side Story for the West Side Story suite at the Lincoln Center. And I had this amazing experience on the Koch Theater stage, which is the former New York State Theater, at the Lincoln Center, you know, right there on Broadway. And they chose me and I got to do these performances and that really opened the door to musical theater for me. And from there, things started, I mean, really compiling fast. That's when Beauty and the Beast came about and Kiss Me Kate and A Little Night Music and all these musical theater shows started coming into play. Um, and I was booked uh, nonstop for years uh, until COVID hit. And that was really the first time where momentum got stopped for me starting as a young baseball player falling forward into singing. Um, and then as as COVID hit, I had to make some decisions and I had just started getting interest in recording online and, and, you know, putting stuff on Spotify and on Apple and, and recording CDs. And, um, and so during the pandemic, I really invested some time and effort into that. Um, and to this point, I have well over 2 million streams um, just in the last two years growing in this very niche category that I sit of kind of, classical crossover classical musical theater land um and it just it continues to grow i continue to 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 gain steam that way um and that that's led to some incredible opportunities tell me about uh the whole america's got talent thing that's a great that's a great segue so <laughs> um it was as simple as this i was at home between performances this summer and um, my wife and I just bought a house here in Buffalo and because uh, that's where she's from. And after the pandemic, we decided we wanted to live where we wanted to live and her family's here. So we're doing that. And uh, so we're here with my son. It was almost his second birthday. And I get a, a phone call from a number I don't recognize. And, and it basically says, hi, this is a producer from NBC. I need you to call me at your earliest convenience about something urgent. Now, if you were me, you'd be like, this is a scam. This is not true. Why would a producer from NBC be calling me directly? Why wouldn't they call my managers? Or, you know, I had a, a myriad of questions about how this all works. But I also was kind of interested. So I just took a shot in the dark and responded, said, hello, this is John. And they kind of presented the information. The group Metaphysic had just uh, won the quarterfinals or whatever they, they called the episode of America's Got Talent by doing deep fake technology where they turned Daniel Emmett, a dear friend and an amazing performer of mine, into Simon Cowell. And he sang <laughs> this amazing song, You're the Inspiration by David Foster. And um, the world exploded. I mean, it went viral instantly. There were, I think it had over 100 million views between YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Just boom went crazy. It was one of the highest rated episodes of the, of the series. And so they wanted to follow that up and take it to the next level. And what they were thinking was they wanted to take Simon and then add Terry Crews and Howie Mandel to the mix. <laughs> and Daniel had suggested, well, why don't you do something that's just, you know, so remarkable and so far from what other people would have seen? Why don't we do something like the famous opera song Nessun Dorma. I mean, everyone has heard it at some point, you know, whether you recognize the name, you've definitely heard it because it's one of those things that just floats out there and everyone hears it at some point from these kind of shows. And um, they said, yeah, but we need to find the perfect people if we're going to win. And they have to, they have to be kind of like Daniel himself, where it's, there are things about your face that we can make work with the technology, but also we need the right performer, the right personality, the right kind of person to sing, to make this kind of boom in the semi-final episode, which was live. It was a live episode, um, which was pretty cool. So anyways, we go through this whole thing and they tell me the dates. And, and here's the craziest part. I was booked for another show at that exact time. And in my realm, it's very challenging to get out of contracts because... You know, you, you get them six to 10 months ahead of time, maybe two years ahead of time, and then you get close. Most of the people are booked then. And so it's, it's not it's not kosher to just pull out. And so I, I contacted the company, which was Knoxville Opera in Tennessee. And I said, so it's not conflicting with any performances, but I would need to miss a bunch of rehearsals for the show that I'm doing with you. 
what do you say? Can I go on America's Got Talent? And they immediately said yes. This blew my mind. They were like, you need to do this. We support you in every way. We'll make it happen. Do whatever you need to do. Just keep us in the loop. And so I, I will never forget their kindness, and I thank them. Thank you, Knox the Opera. Uh, <laughs> right. Thank them everywhere I go, because yeah. not only did I get to keep both jobs, <laughs> but they facilitated me going out to Los Angeles in the middle of rehearsals for a major production that they were doing, go out to L.A., do the live performance, you know, do the whole thing, get to meet the judges. I mean, the episode you can find on YouTube it was pretty miraculous. Simon Cowell said it was the best act of the series. And of course we won and went on to- He the liked series. the way he looked and sung. Oh yeah, how he really liked the way he <laughs> sounded too. In fact, he took credit. He said, wow, how'd you get my real voice up there? <laughs> For a second there, I thought when I saw it, I thought I thought Simon Cowell was actually singing. It's it's incredible technology. <laughs> the guys the guys at Metaphysic are absolute geniuses. They're They're, going to change the world. Their goal is to stay in front of this technology and use it for good because it's going to be used for bad at some point. And so they want to be the leading source in the good side of it. Um, it's kind of their thing. And so I, I was happy to be involved and I'm glad it, and people just loved it. People just loved it. And that has opened a lot of doors for me since then, because as a classically trained singer, it's hard to kind of turn into the more popular side of things, into film and the recording industry outside of the classical side of the recording industry and into um, popular concert realms. And a lot of opportunities have come just because now I've been on, you know, I've, I've performed live in front of 36 million people and then another 100 million online and it keeps getting out there. And so I, I'm very thankful to America's Got Talent and to Metaphysic for inviting me. Um, and my career has definitely been changed ever since. So that wasn't take, that was live. That was live. That entire thing. Um, every episode before the semifinal episodes of America's Got Talent are taped. The semifinals and the finals are live. <laughs> so what you saw was this what, incredible yeah. live performance, live singing, live technology, boom. And the only thing I'll say, and NBC can yell at me all they want, is that they did a they should have shown more of the singers so that the audience at home that wasn't in the theater could have had the spectacle of look, there's John's face. Wait, Howie's face. They're exactly the same. But that's okay. It still was amazing. <laughs> oh my God. You guys nailed it. I mean, the singing was outstanding. Thank you. Really? I mean, those guys, Patrick, uh, Patrick Daly and, and Daniel Emmett are, are phenomenal. It, it, they've been such buddies. We were just like thick as thieves out there and um, we keep in touch and it's, it's cool when these kind of things happen, you know? This has been great, John. Do you have anything else you want to you want to say? Well, I just wanted to, you know, bring up the music that I've been doing. If people are interested, I you can find me on Instagram. I that's where I'm most active, which is just at John Risen, my name, J O H N R I E S E N. Um, feel free to reach out. I, I love responding to people. I travel a lot, and when I'm away from my little family, I keep myself busy either on my computer or on my phone so I don't get myself in trouble. <laughs> is your son around? He's not. He's at daycare. Oh, no. I would bring him right here. Yeah, I wanted to see your son. Well, I could do something <laughs> super dad-like. Go ahead. This is, I do this all the time now. I can't help it. You know you're a parent when, or, you know, people with pets do this yeah. too. All I want to do all day is just show people my son. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. How adorable. This little boy. And then, like, this Oh, little my guy. God. Oh. Forget about America's because got talent. Put him on. Oh, I know he is so. <laughs> he, he definitely got his mother's looks. He is just so beautiful, and he's so strong. I mean, this little two-year-old guy. It's already broken his crib, and so we had to give him a big boy bed already because. Oh my God, he is adorable. I'm so excited to see what his life's like. John, I want to thank you so much. It's been a great interview. Uh, I just want to tell our listeners that if they like the interview, please feel free to hit the subscribe button or the thumbs up button. And I want to thank everyone. John, thank you so much. Thank you.